to the table and have that moment of realizing you are a priest in God's eyes. You have that relationship with him. Now, Paul did lay out a couple of qualifications when it came to communion. He uh, got on the church there at Corinth quite a bit and said, hey, you're doing it wrong because you're really throwing kind of this big party and, and you're kind of ignoring some people and you're, you're playing favorites elsewhere and, and that's not how it should be. It's all about coming before God and remembering the price that he paid. It's not about us, but it's about what God has done for us. Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's the whole point of what we're going to do in the next few minutes. We're going to worship God through our singing. We're going to worship God by coming to the table. If you're here today and you know, you're not feeling right in your relationship with God, let me challenge you two ways. First, do what you have to do to get right with God. I know for me, that's typically some confession, some repentance, accepting God's forgiveness in my life. Sometimes it means I may have to go speak with somebody. Maybe that person's here, maybe they're not. If they are, hey, here's a great opportunity. Because the second challenge is, don't wait. Get it done. If they're not here, make the plan to go and, and talk with them and correct those wrongs. Seek that forgiveness where you need to. But I would encourage you, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Take part in this. Make sure your heart's right. Make sure you're in the right relationship. And then come up realizing you, you're a child of the king. It was for you and your sin that this bread symbolizing Christ's body was broken. And his blood was shed symbolized through the cup. So as we sing, that's how I'd like you to do it. Just kind of step out, kind of get some lines rolling here. And uh, I'll be up here if there's any questions or can help. If you are at a point where you cannot physically get up and come, just let uh, myself know or Terry, if you can kind of help monitor at the back there, just raise your hand. We'll make sure that we get the cup and the bread to you. We want everybody to be able to participate as children of the King this morning. Would you stand? Let me pray. And then we'll begin singing and uh, we'll just kind of fall out into lines here. Father, I'm so thankful for who you are, what you have done for us the opportunity that we have, the freedom that we have today to be able to come before the table and take part in the, the bread and the, the juice, the cup, the, the symbols of your great love for us. Father, I pray as we do this that first and foremost, you would be honored and glorified. It's not about us today. It is all about you, and we want that to be very clear. But Father, we also thank you so much that we have the freedom and the privilege. We don't have to go through other people. We don't have to go through red tape and, and all the steps that sometimes necessary to get things accomplished in this world. We, we have that freedom just at any time, at any place to approach the throne of God. And so we do so this morning. We do so in honor of you. And we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen.
you stand and join us as we move into our worship. Shall rise to thee. 
strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other, your name, that the nations sing and loud, because nothing has the power to say. strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other, your name, let the nation sing it louder, because nothing has the power to say. Father God, as we continue in our worship this morning, we are so thankful for the power of that name. We are not worthy, we are not deserving by any stretch, and yet you have shown your love to us in ways we will never be able to fully understand. And Father, we just honor you and worship you today in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Kids, we can head off to junior church. And as they are getting ready to go, two other quick announcements. Number one, we have been doing a can drive for Ailey and Sonia in their Togo trip. Wednesday is the end, so if you have been like hoarding pop cans and bottles or, or any other kind of refundables, and you're holding on to it so that you can like make a big impact at the end, it's the end. You need to bring those in, okay? Uh, we'd like to have them all here by Wednesday, so that gives us time to... Uh, uh, get them turned in, and then we're going to just take a few moments next Sunday and pray over Ailey and Sonia as they get ready to head to Togo. So I encourage you, be back for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a great time for us to just, again, come together as a church family. The other announcement I wanted to make sure you saw was in your bulletin, but on Sunday the 18th and on Wednesday the 21st of August, we're going to be having our student ministries Reduce the Risk Child Abuse Prevention Training. So on the 18th, it'll be right after the morning service, probably in the back room, 12, 15-ish, depending on how long-winded the pastor is that day. Um, and then on Wednesday, the 21st, we're going to do that one at 6.30, which is normally when we start our prayer meeting, but uh, we're going we're gonna to get that training done, and then we will just go right into prayer, probably around 7. The training does not take long, maybe half hour. Stacy's going to do the one on Sunday, so you know it'll get done faster, because she actually talks faster than I do. But uh, Wednesday, we'll do that as well. You need to be a part of one of those two training sessions if you work with any student of any age, from high school to nursery, all right? This is something that we do for a number of reasons. One, our insurance requires it, but two, most importantly, we want to make sure that our people understand 
our responsibility when it comes to taking care of these kids. A lot of you parents, you know, you just send your kids off down to the basement, hoping, trusting that there are qualified people down there. And there are. We do background checks. We continue to do different trainings and follow-ups. And if you have any questions on how that system works, please feel free to ask me, and we'll make sure that you are comfortable and aware of what is going on. All right, this morning, we are getting back into our study on the different names of God. And I thought, you know, what great way. It's been a couple weeks. We should take a test. (laughs) Okay, let's try it again. We should take a test. That's right. Fake it till you make it, guys. Come on, work with me. All right, so we've talked talked about three names so far. What was the first name of God that we talked about? This is the easiest one, really. Jehovah was the first one. Yes, we talked about the name Jehovah. If you remember, that name means that God is, first of all, self-existing. Isn't it nice to know we serve a God that doesn't rely on us to take care of him? Kyle is taking care of some cats and some plants for some friends who've gone out of town. They didn't ask me or Kelly to do it for some reason. Because if we get there, they're just dead. (laughs) Poor kitties. Um, Those those animals are really, they don't realize how risky this week is going to be for them. Because Kyle's taking care of them. God doesn't, like, need a cat sitter. Isn't that great? He's self-existent. He does not rely on us for anything. It also means that God is unchanging. He is faithful. The same God that was written about in the Old Testament and the New Testament is the same God we worship today. So the same characteristics of justice and righteousness and, oh, thank goodness, grace and mercy, the same ones that we enjoy today. That name Jehovah is also his personal name. You know, when you get an individual's personal name, not their title, you get their first name, it's like, oh, this person wants to have a relationship, a personal relationship. I I tease a couple of you, Chad especially, because he likes to call me pastor, because I think he knows it irritates me a little bit. So I've started calling him electrician. (laughs) But he just smiles, knowing he's gotten under my skin, and he's good. God wants to have a personal, practical, life-changing relationship. If that does not blow our minds, we're not paying attention Again, we're not worthy of any of that. But that's his desire, and that's why he calls himself Jehovah. Week two, what was the second name? I'll I'll give you a hint. It starts with Jehovah. What do you think it was? Oh, you were so close, but no. Is that what you were going to say, Dylan? Elohim? Oh, you should have, because that is the correct answer. (laughs) Sorry, buddy. Let's try it. Jehovah Elohim. Remember that word Elohim simply means gods. And so when we say the Lord, the great, the mighty, it is greater than all other gods. Now, if that does not bring you peace when you lay down to sleep at night, I don't know what else will. The very fact that God is greater than anything. We know that there are no other gods compared to him, but think about all the things we throw up there as gods. The things we trust in, the things we rely on. Because God is greater than all other gods. You know what else that means? He is greater than any circumstance, any struggle, any problem that we face. And listen, I know what some of you are facing. I know what I'm facing, and I know I am not capable of dealing with what I struggle with. But my God is. And because it's Jehovah Elohim, we have great hope in who He is. The third one that we talked about, I'll give you another hint. It starts with Jehovah. Is that what you were going to say? Look at the one student who raises her hand. And just like Dylan, you shouted, no, I'm teasing. Jehovah Jireh. What did that mean? Lord, my provider. Yeah, we shared this one down at uh, Lakeside Park at the floating stage. And what a great opportunity to witness to the provision that God gives to us. I, I don't have to worry about anything. Now, I tend to, you know, that's just who I am. But I I don't have to sit there and fret about, is the sun going to come up in the morning? Is the the moon going to go in the right spot? Are the tides going to be correct? I don't have to stress out about those things because my God, Jehovah Jireh, has that taken care of. And then, because we know his personal name, we know a personal relationship, that means he is providing for everything we need. 
Now, we may look at this as a little bit of a catch. It's not a catch, but we kind of define it. I don't always get what I want, when I want, how I want, do I? In fact, let's be honest. I rarely get what I want, when I want, how I want. There's no promise in God's name, Jehovah Jireh, that that's going to happen. In fact, he says, I will give you what you need in my timing, in God's timing, in his ways, and according to his purpose. And can I just be honest? You'd like it if your pastor was honest, wouldn't you? God doesn't seem to give things that I want when I want. I want it now. Okay, if I'm going to have a problem, if I'm going to have a situation in three weeks, I kind of want those resources here so I can, I can be ready. And yet God tends to give me those resources in two weeks, six days, 24 hours, you know, right on the cusp sometimes. And I get a little nervous. I get a little cowardly. But I shouldn't because God has promised to provide. So three great names that remind us of who God is, how he's working in our life. And of course, we've been focusing on prayer. And so when we pray in these names, it just should, it should really radicalize how we pray. Our name for this week is the name Jehovah Nissi. And this name is found in Exodus chapter 17. I want you to turn there in your Bibles. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's page 39. If you've got the church app, you can go to the notes page. If you've got the U Bible app, you can go there. Uh, and just follow along as we walk through this name today. And as you're finding your place there in Exodus 17, let me give you the context. We know the book of Exodus deals a lot with Moses and the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. And at this point, Israel has left Egypt. They're on the road. And you know what? They're far enough on the road, which it's getting to that, parents, you're going to understand, the annoying part of the journey, right? Here it is. I got to go potty. And that's the wife. I'm hungry. <laughs> On this side. I'm hungry. I want to eat a burger. I hate Burger King. I want taco. I don't want taco smell. I want. <sighs> I wish, and I know my parents, we had a big old station wagon. And back then, we didn't have to worry about seatbelts. We could lay down in the back and sleep. And, and my parents would get us up early. I do this with our family. We get up early and we travel when it's still dark and they're sleeping. And I can get a few hours of peace and quiet sleeping while I'm driving. I wish sometimes I had one of those windows right behind the front seat that just, like in those limos. It's the only place I've ever seen it. But man, I would, I wouldn't have to listen. I bet Moses wishes he had one of those as he's walking with the children of Israel here in Egypt because they are complaining. They are whining about everything. It's too hot. It's too cold. I don't have food. I don't have water. We should have just stayed in Egypt. It's like, really? You guys were slaves, man. They were killing you, literally, physically, every aspect. And you want to go back? Well, they're here, and they're whining again. They're camping at this place called Rephidim. The problem is there's no water in Rephidim. So the people complain, and they whine to Moses, and Moses is like up to here with it. And he goes to God. He says, all right, God, I'm going to paraphrase just a little bit. What am I supposed to do with these whiners? Do I turn the bus and go back home? Of course not. God says, here, I've got a great plan for you. There's a certain rock over here. I want you to go to that rock. I want you to take your staff. I want you to smack the rock. And when you hit that rock, water's going to just flow out. Could you imagine standing there and hearing this explanation? You want me to what? Hit the rock in water? Okay. Moses does exactly that. Now, I don't know how much of a you know, big wind-up he got into swinging. He had to be frustrated. But he goes and he hits that rock, and, and the water just comes out, and, and the people have all the water they need. The animals are all set. Everything is good until we get to verse 8. Look at chapter 17, verse 8. It says, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand, verse 12, grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. 
So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua, in verse 13, overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. So we've got the people, they're all thirsty, and they're getting their water now. And and we don't really know exactly how much time, but not much. And this group of people from Amalek show up. Let me give you a little background on the Amalekites. This is a nation of people who are descended from Esau. You remember Esau? You got Abraham, you got Isaac, and you had those two twins that just loved each other to pieces, right? Esau and who? Jacob. They got along like, well, like kid, kids in a car on a long trip. They hated each other. They were two very different individuals. Esau was that, that rugged outdoorsman. Jacob was the more refined, quiet kind of guy, like the cities versus the country. Now, Esau was the older of the two twins. And so, according to customs, he was to receive what was called the birthright. The birthright was given to the oldest male uh, child in the house, and, and they received extra inheritance, so they got some extra money. They kind of had the, the inside scoop on the family business. They were going to be better off than their brothers and sisters. When dad died, they become the leader of the family. The interesting thing is God said, Jacob, you are going to get the birthright, not your older brother Esau. The problem was that Jacob was a lot like us. He was impatient. Instead of waiting on God's timing in his way, through his methods, you remember what happened, right? Jacob tricked his brother Esau a couple of different times, stole that birthright, took advantage of his blind father, and took what was, well, what God had promised him, but he overstepped his boundaries. He, he rushed ahead of God instead of following him. And because of that, there was a lot of animosity between Esau and Jacob. And Jacob actually had to run away for his life at some point. That animosity grew. When the children of Israel are leaving Egypt, they're coming here. They're not going anywhere near the land of Amalek, the Amalekites, they weren't trespassing. They weren't calling, you know, hey, give us food, give us water, whatever. They were just moving through. But the Amalekites saw an opportunity. Maybe it was a preemptive strike, I don't know, but they saw the opportunity. So they attacked the nation of Israel. Moses sees them coming and he he calls his general Joshua. Remember Joshua, right? He'll soon become the right-hand guy for Moses, and eventually he'll succeed Moses as leader of Israel and lead the people into the promised land. Moses says, Joshua, I want you to get the troops together. I want you to go down into this valley, and you're going to fight the Amalekites. You're going to wipe them out. And while you're down there, I'm going to go up on this hill with Aaron and her leaders with Moses. And, And he said, I'm going to stand up on this hill, and I'm going to watch the battle, and we're going to see that God is going to do some great things. Now, it's an interesting battle plan that that Moses has. He's going to go up on the hill, and he's going to raise his hands. And as long as his hands were up, the nation of Israel was winning. Now, you can imagine trying to stand for very long with your arms up, the big old wooden staff in one hand. Um, I'm already getting sore and tired. Again, I'm not walking in the wilderness for 10 hours a day either, but... You can imagine, he's going to get tired. And and so as soon as his hands started to fall, well, the nation of Amalek started to win. Now Moses and and Aaron and Hur, they're smart guys, and they see this. And so they say, hey, we got to help out here. They bring a stone for Moses to sit on, and then one gets on one side, one gets on the other, and they hold up his arms. And listen, I know that it's great that someone still holds up your arms, but I've been in a position where I've had to have my arm up in the air for a long time, and I was actually resting it. But you know what happens? That starts to cramp up, doesn't it? This is not how we're supposed to be. So you can still imagine the pain that Moses probably went through at some point. But he kept his arms up with the help of Aaron and Hur, and we see that in the end, they defeat the nation of Amalek there. And Moses, in response, builds an altar. And this is where he calls it Jehovah Nissi. Look at verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, this is after the victory, he said, write this as a memorial in the book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under, the, uh, under heaven. 
And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is My Banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, that word banner is a Hebrew word, nace. That's all the Hebrew you're going to learn today. It stands for anything that we would hold up as a flag or a banner or a standard. This does not really fly right into my life as relatable because it's been a few years since I've been at battle. Like, a lot. Of so let's understand a little bit. How many of you have ever watched the Mel Gibson movie, The Patriot? Okay. If you haven't watched the movie, it's a good movie. It's a little bloody, it's a little gory, but it's still a good movie. It's, com- I won't say completely, mostly historically inaccurate, but it's still fun to watch because, hey, Mel Gibson, right? Um, in that movie, it, it takes place during the War of Independence, 1776. Mel Gibson plays a, a guy by the name of uh, Benjamin Martin, who's a quiet man at this point in his life. His wife has died from sickness. He's got older kids and younger kids. He just wants to stand on his plantation and raise his children, but the battle's going on. And his older children get involved. And the townsfolk are coming to him saying, you know, Martin, you've got to get involved. You could, you could lead us, and it would be very good. And he's like, no, 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 okay, I'm going into battle. And he starts to run a militia. And as you get to the final battle scene, there's several things that happen that I think will help you understand what we're talking about when we talk about a banner when it comes to to battle. They're at the point where the militia has been broken down, the American troops have been broken down, the British troops are winning the battle. And they're starting to press forward and knock the Americans back. And, And Gibson sees this. Martin is his character's name. He sees this, and he can't let this happen. And so he's the hero of the story, right? So he does heroic things. And he runs forward, and he grabs a flag out of this guy's hands. Well, this guy was what we would call a flag bearer. Every unit in the military had a flag bearer. And the bearer had that flag for a number of reasons. One, it was a sign of identification. He would stand by the leadership in the battle, of course, all the generals, they're all up on the hill, you know, safe. But the ones who are leading the troops, they're down here. And the flag bearer would be there with the flag. And so as I'm fighting and I get caught up in a little skirmish over here, I finish that off and I'm looking, where's my, my company? I can see the flag and I can go. I can identify with them. I know that's where I'm supposed to be. And, and if my flag bearer drops that flag, someone's got to pick it up and keep going. It was a sign of identification. Well, British troops are winning. And Gibson sees this, and so he runs up, he grabs this flag out of this guy's hand, and instead of retreating like everybody else, he starts running towards the British army, and he's waving it around, and he's shouting, no, don't retreat, you got to fight, you know, he's just Mr. Cheerleader. And as he's going this way, and all of his troops are going back, you know, I, I kind of think, and I'm not running too far that way, But what you see is they slowly start to turn around and form in behind him, and they start to move forward. See, Benjamin Martin running forward with that flag was a sign of hope. People saw him, and they said, hey, we're rallying. Maybe, maybe we can do this. And and so they start to chase after the British. (coughs) And as they're going, more and more of those who were quitting get back into the battle. They move forward, and ultimately what we see is that flag becomes a sign of victory. They beat back the British troops and and they win the day, which technically they didn't in that battle. But hey, Hollywood versus history. We know who wins, right? Hollywood. And and at the very end of that battle, they take that flag and they stamp it into the ground and and they're all, wow, we won. So we've got the flag kind of showing us three different things, a, a sign of identification, a sign of hope, and a sign of victory. All those things are wrapped up in this title, The Lord, My Banner. Let me show you how. When you think about praying in the name of God, when we pray in the name of Jehovah, our our personal God, isn't it nice if we can go to God and and we don't have to introduce ourselves, we don't have all the formalities, we can just kind of break down and say, God, I'm having uh, like the 10th Monday in a row and I need help. And he listens. It's personal relationship that we have. 
When we pray to God as Jehovah Elohim, we know that, that He is greater than anything that we can, can ever face. We don't have to be afraid. We just have to trust in Him. When we pray in the name of Jehovah Jireh, we know that He's going to be present at just the right time with just the right resources that we need. And when we pray in the name of Jehovah Nisi, we pray three ways. First, we pray through identifying ourselves with God and God alone. Think about what it means to identify yourselves with somebody or something. Remember last fall, my buddy Eric gave Kelly and I two tickets to go see our very first NFL football game ever. The Buffalo Bills, try to hold your applause here, versus the Chicago Bears. Yeah, a couple of us were like, yeah, the, who? We had a blast. We got there right after the services. We, we took off. We got there right as the first quarter was ending. And you know what? There was no doubt that our seats were in Bill's territory. We had guys all around us, and they had the flags, and they had the jersey. I don't know why you would pay 150 200 bucks for any jersey, but you know they were doing it especially when you're just going to jump on tables at the end. Uh, these guys had the hats and the fingers, and, and, and they were just all bills, 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 bills. And the score wasn't really out of you know, range at that point. It was really low scores, close game. But we had a couple Bears fans around us. Now listen, Kelly doesn't even care about football. I'm a Bears fan because I grew up in Chicago. I did not wear a Bears jersey because I am not willing to go into enemy lines and intentionally tick them off, all right? I'm just not willing to do that. But there were some people around us who had the Bears jerseys on and the hats, and they were identifying themselves in enemy territory as a Bears fan. And I can tell you, when that, you know, as the game starts to go on, the Bills fans, and they were pumped so they threw that ball away and it was run back for a touchdown and then another one and then another one and pretty soon it was a blowout for the Bears and those Bears fans as the score increased as the liquid courage flowed through their lips <laughs> they became more and more willing to identify themselves as Bears now listen the Bills fans still were pretty proud of who they were there's a bunch of and, and forgive me knuckleheads out at a football game. And at the end of the day, they're going to go home, and yes, they had fun, and their life is only going to be changed because many of them are going to have a pretty nasty headache the next day. How much more should we be willing to identify with Christ? We, we don't have to pay 200 bucks for a jersey that says Team Jesus on it, right? We, we don't have to go out and, and do all these things to get into the game. Through Jesus Christ, we are there. We've accepted Him as our Lord and Savior. We are there. We've identified ourselves with God. And yet, we're hesitant to go out into our workplaces, to our neighborhoods, and even sometimes in our families and identify ourselves as a child of the King. Paul told us that we need to identify in this way. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh... I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says when we identify ourselves with God, there's something that has to happen. We have to put to death our old self. Now, that seems pretty extreme, doesn't it? But here's the reality. If we don't put this to death, it's just going to keep coming back. If we don't put to death some of those sins and those choices that we continually make that are go against God's will, they're just going to continually come back and haunt me. Don't be shocked that you're struggling with some kind of sin in your life if you haven't put it to death. Paul says, kill it. Let me take it another step that may be even more extreme. Your plans, your agendas, your hopes, your dreams, I think that's all included in this crucifixion. We're to put all those things to death. You know, all the things that I, I hope for for my children, that shouldn't be my goal. Paul says, put it to death. And here's, here's why. I, I don't want to, my plans are pretty good. 
I had great plans for my children. They were supposed to go marry somebody really wealthy, live in three different parts of the continent so I could spend, you know, spring in one where it's warm and winter in another place where it's warm. It was a great plan. There's nothing wrong with that. The reality is that my plans are nothing compared to what God's plans are. And even the best plans that I have are small and, and tiny and worthless when I think about what God really wants to do. I have to be willing to put myself to death and identify with God and God alone through Jesus Christ. So to pray in the name of Jehovah Nissi is to identify myself with someone other than me. To wave that banner, that flag saying, I am a child of the King. When we pray in the name of Jehovah Nissi, we are also placing our hope in God alone. And we have this tendency to place our hope in so many other things, right? I'm placing my hope in um, my bank account. Some days that's not bad. Some days it's not so good. I have uh, my hope sometimes placed in my career, my job, my social step, my whatever. You can put in anything. The reality is, how long do those things last? My bank account disappears faster than I can get in and out of the mechanic down at the garage. Right? Our, our, our retirement funds shot with one bad tweet. We have no control over these things, and yet we consistently place our faith, our hope in those things instead of in God himself. I don't know. Will you have a job when you walk in in the morning? Will you be alive? We just saw two crazy mass shootings last night, yesterday. How do we know? We have no clue. And so instead of placing hope and trust in, in anything other than God, we've got to play it onto Him. Again, Paul put it this way. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, he said, If you then be risen with Christ, seek the things that are above For Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things on the earth. Because we're followers of Christ, our hope, our trust should be placed on things that are permanent, not temporary. And if we were to incorporate that principle, placing our trust in God alone, can you imagine how different our prayer lives might be? Instead of me constantly praying, and, and I do, God, get me out of this situation I'm in that I don't like. Give me some ease. Give me some comfort. Instead of praying those prayers, I might just be saying, God, give me the strength and the patience I need to endure this trial. Help me to show your love, your glory in this difficult time. Instead of me saying, God, I need this, I'm after this, I need this, can you give me this? Maybe I'd start praying, God, give me a heart of sacrifice. Where I'd be willing to not just set aside the things I want, but perhaps even sell off some of the things that I have in order to see the kingdom move forward. That's contrary to what we want to do, isn't it? If we're really placing our hope in Christ, If we're really praying in the name of Jehovah Nissi, our hope is is in something so much greater than things of this earth. We're setting our mind on things that are above. That's where we're supposed to be focused. Thirdly, when we pray in the name of Jehovah Nissi, we're claiming that victory through God alone. Doesn't it feel hard to get a win some days? I've... uh, I've been going to the gym now for almost two years. I know, it's easy to tell, right? That's the frustrating part. I will go and I will sweat and I will work out on that elliptical and I'll go you know, lift some weights and I'll do all the things that I can. And I will then go home and eat salad, for goodness sakes. I had a salad the other day with no dressing. What kind of insanity is this? I made up for it the next time. I get down a few pounds and then a Pizza Hut commercial comes on and I gain five right back, just listen. (laughs) I 
I don't get it. And I'll be honest, the same struggle in my spiritual life. I work hard at this one area and just giving over my life 100%. I'm going to give it all to you, God. And it seems like as soon as I think I've achieved something, life kind of just goes, oh, hey, I'm still here. <laughs> and I feel like I get pulled back three steps. It's this constant back and forth. It's this battle. I, I don't feel victorious too many days. I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe it's just me. Can I tell you, this is not what our Christian life is supposed to be like. Even though we may not feel like we've gained victory, can I tell you, we have victory. Let me give you three key areas we've got victory. Number one, we have victory over sin. Romans 6, 6, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sins. Victory and enslavement do not go together, do they? (laughs) When Christ died on that cross, he gave us victory over sin. We're no longer slaves. So listen, this is going to sound really harsh. It's going to sound kind of unkind, and I don't mean it to, but the reality is this. Some of us are struggling in sins for days and years, and we, we, we just feel enslaved. If you're truly a Christian, if you're truly giving your life over to God, here's what's happening. It's not that you're in bondage anymore. You just keep going back to it. It's almost like I'm putting those shackles back on. Now, I'm not saying you've got the power to destroy that. But God promises us we have victory over sin, and so it's a matter of submitting and surrendering ourselves to God above all. God's already fought the battle over sin. We don't have to fight it every day. Claim that victory that God has already given to us. We have victory over sin. We have victory over self. We talked about crucifying ourselves. Then Paul goes on in in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Think about Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2 and creation. God speaks and it comes into existence and then God declares it good. That's what we're talking about when it comes to creation. Now Paul says, listen, you are a new creation. You are a new creature. All of those things that you were representing before, all those influences have no control on you anymore. Not It's not just that we're no longer slaves. We've been washed, we've been cleaned, we've been given new clothes, we've got new ID papers. We are a new person because of Christ. That means myself, my my struggles, my attitudes, my frustrations, those things do not rule me anymore. That's a great victory that we can have. Thirdly, we have victory over death. I often preach out of 1 Corinthians at funerals, chapter 15. Because it just really provides some great hope. Let me just read a little portion here. Verse 54 starts out with this. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality. In other words, when this old body that is broken and doesn't seem to respond to to treadmills, but certainly to ice cream, uh, when this body fails once and for all, as a believer, I'm promised a new body, a glorified body. And so when the perishable, that which falls apart, is replaced with that will never fall apart, then will come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, the battle is already won. God's already taken that flag And he's planted it firmly in the ground. There is victory through him. We're still fighting some battles. The war is not over. But it's finished. Jesus said so much on the cross, didn't he? It is finished. He declared the victory that day. And now it's uh, up to us to just stand firm and to keep going forward, trusting God that he will be everything that he has promised to be. So because of Jehovah Nissi, we can identify ourselves as children of the King. We can place our hope in God above all other things, and we can claim the victory that he's promised. There's a, there's a ton of beautiful things in this name, Jehovah Nissi. But I want you to understand that it all begins at one place, by becoming a child 
of the king. These promises that we see are not for everyone. They are for those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you haven't done that, if you don't have a personal, practical, life-changing relationship, I want to encourage you, don't go out those doors today without talking to somebody who can help you find out what that means. It's the most important decision you can ever make. And I know that there's some of us here today who we've accepted Christ as our Savior, but we don't feel like we're really that victorious. Let me challenge you to, to pray in the name of Jehovah Nissi over this week. Claim that name. Look for the victories God has given to us through Jesus Christ. Challenge yourself in that way. When we use these names, we learn more about who God is, what He has done for us. We find confidence in Him. And when we have confidence in God, you know what? We can go out and we can face some difficult circumstances knowing that He loves us deeply and that He cares for us greatly. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer as the praise team comes? Father, again, I just thank you so much for the name Jehovah Nissi. Thank you for the promises that we have in it, the truth that comes from your word. God, I know in my own life that there are days when I feel anything but a winner. And honestly, Lord, most of those days I'm basing win and loss on things other than what you do. I base it on my feelings, my emotions, my progress chasing after my own goals. God, help me to identify in you only. Help me to boldly stand up and say that I am a child of the King, to find my hope there, to claim the victory that you have given to us. Father, help us as a family, as a congregation, that we would do that and that we would let you change our lives and, and Lord, give us a great impact on this community as we reach out with the gospel of Christ. We ask all of this in his name. Amen.
that is a song of victory, isn't it? Now, let me try that again. That is a song of victory, isn't it? Yes, it is. All right, come on, pretend you're at your Bears game. <laughs> what a great hope we have, knowing that Christ is our Lord and our Savior, that God is our Jehovah Nissi. What a great reminder. I hope that it was a challenge for you as you go out this week. Pray that you will be strong and uh, courageous because you're going to need it. Right? This world is not a pretty place some days. Wednesday night, this coming up, there will be no youth group, but we will have prayer meeting at 630. So if you can make it out for that, that'd be great. We'd love to have you. And uh, other than that, I think it's, uh, schedules and calendars are all good. Let's go to God in prayer and give him the rest of this day. Father, we thank you so much again just for who you are, what you have done for us, how you have provided consistently even before we knew that we had a need. Thank you, Lord, that we can identify as your children because of what you've done for us on Calvary. I thank you, Lord, that through the cross we have great hope as we face this world. Father, I am so grateful you have given us victory. Even when it feels like death and dying in tombs, you're the God who has conquered all of those things. And so while we may struggle, we will face some setbacks, we know that you are always going to be victorious in all that you have planned. And so, Lord, help us to trust you. Help us keep our eyes focused on you and to be quick to help those around us who need you. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your love. Keep us safe this week. But above all, we pray you would keep us in your will. And we will come back together very soon and give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. God bless and have a great day.